Hello, everyone. I'm Colleen Vanderzyden. So happy you're here watching and listening. As you know, my passion, my purpose is to help you live your best, your most unique, your most awesome life. And I do that in all sorts of different ways. And here we are in the human form where we all have problems, concerns, issues, things that we drag through our lifetime. And I help people as a medium and as a spiritual life coach. And today I have a special show planned because we have a special guest. We have Dr. Candace Creasman. She is a therapist, an author, and a meditation teacher. She's had over 10 years of experience treating clients with mood disorders, personality disorders, chronic pain, and addiction issues. And she's actually working out of Raleigh, North Carolina. So if you are in that area and you're looking for a licensed professional counselor, you can find her there. And I'll post her information on my website. You can find it there and we'll talk about it a little bit too. She primarily works with people who have survived domestic violence and uh, sexual assault. But this is really cool because she helps clients develop awareness and self-compassion so they can live full intentional lives. And that's what we like to do here on these shows on A1R Psychic Radio. And what I like to do in my life is help people live that intentional lives. And that's why we like to have some guests on occasion to help. Now, she also does something else that's very interesting. She's a contributor to a meditation app called Insight Timer, and that's very exciting. Now, I met Candace at the Hay House Writers Workshop in October. We were in Orlando, and I was looking for guests for the show, and I was looking for people that I thought would really resonate with my audience because we all have problems, issues, concerns, and it's great if we have somebody like Candace who really knows her stuff, and she does. She's amazing. So, Candace, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, Colleen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. It's going to be a great show. We have so much we can talk about. Now, Candace is writing a book called Soul Wound. So, Candace, tell us about all this. What is a soul wound? Okay, that's like the $64,000 question, right? Okay, so soul wounds are, the most simple way I can think about it is that we have this bad experience that happens when we're children. It could be a set of bad experiences. Sometimes it's one main primary difficult thing, but a lot of times it's sort of like death by a thousand paper cuts, right? So we have this one really bad thing that happens to us, and then we build this very big story around it. So we maybe have an experience of we witness domestic violence when we're growing up. And as a child, we don't really have the emotional or cognitive tools available to us to say, oh, okay, well, that's probably, you know, my parents' issue. That's, you know, that's clearly related to their own struggles. We think, oh, no, how does this reflect on me? So we then start to build these stories that I've found, at least in my work with clients and in my personal life, um, tend to take on kind of three main, you know, looks. So someone can feel like they are a victim. Someone can feel like they are broken or they can feel really shameful. So that can that's basically the story that we then carry into the rest of our lives. So we start to filter all of our other experiences, our relationships, um, you know, our career paths, our identities through these soul wounds. So this bad thing happens and we build the big story. So that's generally what the soul wound is all about. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's something where there's some kind of a traumatic event or something that just profoundly affects someone. Absolutely. It's not something that would just kind of, you know, you could have a perfectly wonderful life and then you wouldn't necessarily have a soul wound. Is that correct? Right. So, and I kind of come from the perspective that nobody really has a perfectly wonderful life, like no matter what it looks like, right? You know, we're all struggling in some way. Um, and that's what I think is unique about the soul wound way of thinking about it is that it doesn't necessarily have to be something that everybody else in the world would think, oh my gosh, that was terrible. You know, it's basically any experience that turns into a way of seeing the world. So, you know, things for children can be very traumatic that for an adult would you know, be no big deal. So it doesn't necessarily have to be some huge, you know, um, terrifying thing, though, unfortunately, for a lot of people, it is, you know. Yeah. And then we end up developing our like our belief systems come off of these, these soul wounds then. And I recall when I was uh, 
started the violin in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And I remember I wanted to talk about it one night to some yeah. people. And they basically just ignored me. Oh. And I that actually came up with a coaching session once because I was like, yeah, it was like I wasn't heard. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed, you know, that kind of thing where people don't feel heard because of these Absolutely. Souls? Absolutely. And that's probably one of the primary uh, features of what can turn into a soul wound is feeling unheard, unseen, misunderstood, dismissed. Um, I have one client who, you know, really the main experience that she can tie her own soul wound to was she got lost in a big department store when she was about five years old. And when her mom finally found her, rather than responding with like kindness and, and support and nurturance, her mom was just like annoyed. And for this client, that was really impactful. So she really learned that, oh my gosh, my feelings just really don't matter. You know, my voice doesn't really matter. So I think your violin example is, is like a perfect example of the ways that we can really incur these soul wounds that we just take with us to, you know, experience to experience. Right. And so then that client you had, so here she is lost in a store, right. probably scared, Terrified. And then to have her mother not even acknowledge right. this is yeah. really, how did that affect her as she's growing up? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, she um, really identified closely with this broken soul wound. Uh, and the way that manifested for her was through really intense anxiety. Um, so she has had really pretty debilitating panic attacks for most of her life. And she's still a young woman. She's in her mid-20s at this point um, and has definitely really reined in you know, the way she experiences her anxiety. So she's definitely very, very functional at this point. Um, but yeah, she basically, um, her fears, I think, because they were so invalidated at such a young age, like her anxiety realized it had to be so big to be noticed that it became a, a problem in and of itself, you know. So this very natural experience that we have of sometimes feeling fearful or sometimes feeling worried really kind of turned into its own beast uh, because she was taught that you have to have an extreme feeling for it to ever actually get validated. Oh, wow. Yeah, that must be so difficult, you know, when you have that reaction and and you don't even realize mm -hmm. that there is a source for this. Right. You know, now, how did you come up with this this phrase soul wound? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, the work like really kind of started um, around my own experience. Um, so I had kind of a physician heal thyself kind of moment where, um, you know, I realized that um, after a really bad, bad breakup um, with someone who had some really severe addiction issues um, that I had just been perpetuating this way of seeing myself and being in the world where I just had to earn everybody's love with perfection. You know, I just had to be the constant overachiever, you know, who never did anything wrong, who was always winning, you know, hashtag winning. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was such an empty way of being that never actually allowed me to feel full or whole or accepted. And so I realized that, you know, this work, and that was while I was actually a therapist, um, that I kind of put the pieces together for my own story. And I realized that this was happening for so many of my clients. You know, they had learned, had learned something about themselves, that they weren't good enough, that they were less than, that they were shameful through some single experience or set of experiences. And they just kept attracting the sort of situations and people and problems to them that would ultimately either open their eyes or keep them stuck. Uh, and so it, this idea of it being a soul wound is really just meant to drive home how, how deeply the wound is felt, you know. That makes sense. It really does. Because, you know, when you talk about children picking up these belief systems based on whatever's happened in their lives, mm -hmm. and it affects them to the core of their beings, yes. and then affects them in every single thing they do. Right. And it's so interesting. You're talking about, you know, being a perfectionist and all, you know, being good and responsible. And it sounds like oh, you're yeah. about me. <laughs> um, because, you know, There's a lot of us out there, Colleen. <laughs> there are. And, you know, we, we all... We conform to societal norms, you know, we're trying to fit in, we want to be liked, and it can be hard to take that risk 
mm. to really look at ourselves. Do you see that your clients have a resistance to looking at themselves? Oh gosh, yeah. Um, it it really depends. It's a pretty broad spectrum. Uh, the folks who are really, really resistant don't stay in therapy very long, <laughs> because I tend to push pretty hard. <laughs> so um, that's just my way. Um, but for the most part, you know, even if there is some resistance, they wouldn't have come in the door if they didn't have some willingness. So I always tell my clients that you know. I'm not worried about you. It's all the people who aren't in therapy that I'm worried about, <laughs> you know, like, because <laughs> you're taking the actual step to figure out how you can have a more meaningful life. Whereas, you know, I think so many other folks either feel hopeless that there's just not a way or just aren't even awake to their own suffering in a lot of ways. So yeah, there's resistance, but it often, you know, gradually starts to fall away when someone starts to feel like the work we're doing is actually having an impact. Yeah, so just the, the simple act of taking a small step mm -hmm. and a simple act of just calling you, making the appointment, showing up for the appointment. It's the you hardest know? thing. It is because you're scared. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. And I know that there have been times where I've, you know, I've thought, oh, I really need to get somebody to help me, you know, look at this from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would have a resistance to the emotional aspect. I don't want to fall into that emotion because yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. And do you have people who think that as well? That is probably one of the primary reasons why people don't go to counseling uh, is because that is another one of the beliefs that can get built up around these soul wounds, particularly the victim soul wound, is that the things that happen inside my mind and inside my heart are so terrifying and potentially so harmful to me that I can't look at that. And that's way too risky. So a big part of counseling is helping folks to realize that you're, you are no single thought or emotion. You're the space that holds all of it. So you, you literally can't be experiencing an emotion that will be bigger than you. That's sort of like saying, if you like fill the teacup farther than the, you know, the teacup can hold, like the teacup's not going to explode. You know, it's just going to run out. <laughs> so we kind of function the same way. The emotion runs out, but we stay together. Yes, it's so true. I went to a workshop with Debbie Ford once years ago. Have mm. you heard of the Debbie Ford and the shadow process? No, but that sounds fascinating. Shadow oh. work I've heard of, but not her in particular. Yeah. Yeah, she passed a few years ago, but she mm. had somebody who is uh, con continuing her work and still does the shadow process workshops. And we were in the workshop where we would basically, um, in small groups, uh, say something that was like our biggest fear. You know, one person said she was a bad mother. Mm. And we would watch she would say I'm a bad mother and we repeat it back to her and eventually what would happen is that emotion would come up and it right. would you know we'd, we'd all be scared and then it would overflow like you said yeah it's okay we can do this yeah there's room for it that's that's yeah. the thing that I end up saying so like so many times a week I feel like I should put it on a bumper sticker is there's there's room for it you know whatever you're feeling you know no matter how conflicted no matter how big it seems there's always going to be room for it Yes. Now, if somebody is open to that, you know, and some people are probably listening and watching now who are thinking, you know, this is interesting. Hmm. I wonder if I have a soul wound. Uh -huh. Now, you did talk about victim a little bit. Right. Uh, when someone's a victim, what do they feel like? How do they come so along? The, the thing that I noticed the most about victim is the, the victim mentality is a sense of helplessness and anger. So there's this sense of, I want people to be better to me. I want my life to be better. But then at the same time, in the same space, there's a sense of powerlessness to do anything about it. You know, so these are folks who will across the board say, I give way more than I get, you know, whether it's in their relationships or in their career, you know, they always feel that they are at a deficit in terms of the work that they're putting in, um, versus, you know, the reward they actually get. Yeah. Do you find that sometimes they feel like they're being attacked? You know, like life has it out for them or people Absolutely. have it out for them? Absolutely. That's totally a fundamental way of thinking for someone who feels like a victim a lot of the times, right? Is that even so it's not just the external world that they feel threatened by, but it's their own internal world. You know, it's that so they fear the feelings that that show up and the, the negative judgments that show up. So they really kind of have this sense of I just can't handle, you know, so much of what I experience. And that's, you know, that's a really crappy place to be. It, it's a really powerless kind of place to be. 
Yeah, and they'll have that self-critical voice going on in their heads, telling them Absolutely. they're stupid and all of this stuff. Oh, yeah. Now, if somebody were wanting to become more aware of this, mm -hmm. what kind of signs would they be exhibiting that would let them know that maybe they've got a little bit of victim energy going? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would say I like to start by looking at your relationships because that's the place where I tend to see the most recurrent patterns, you know? So if you feel like I always, no matter where I go to work, I have the same person who shows up and seems to make me into a doormat, or, you know, in your romantic relationships, you always feel like you're the one who's pulling all the weight and doing all the work, maybe, you know, literally around the house, but also emotionally in the relationship. I like to look at the relationships for patterns because whenever we feel ourselves kind of stuck in the same kind of process, it's, especially if it's an unpleasant one, it's pointing at a, at a soul wound, most likely. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can hear now voices going off in people's heads going, but, but it, it is that way. Uh, yeah. I always have these people at work. Uh, and that's accurate. That has to do. <laughs> and it is accurate. And yeah. so even if it's true, which it might be, and yeah. it could very well be, how can they move out of that yeah. and uh, change it? Because we all know we can't change another person as much as we try. Right. Um, how can we change ourselves? How can we really go, you know what? I have the power to change this. What can we yeah. do about it? Well, it just, it goes back to I have this three-step process because everybody loves a multi-step process. So really <laughs> awareness is the first thing we have to bring to those situations, you know, because it is true that, yeah, you do keep running into the same people because you have the same work to do until you don't have that work to do anymore. So you're going to keep finding the people who draw out that victim mentality because that's the only way you're gonna become aware of it. So we notice it, we notice, wow, yeah, I feel like a doormat every time I interact with this person. I feel like they totally get one over on me. And then we have an opportunity to make a different choice to try out a different way of setting a boundary, a different way of asking for what we need. But we first have to be aware of of the fact that it's even happening. Yes, totally. Awareness and then a choice. You got to right? make a choice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I tell people, you can choose to stay in that negative place. Mm -hmm. That's your right. But if you're not happy and it's not working out for you, then maybe you should try something else. Yeah. What else? do. And it is funny, you know, because we, we do resist and we all do it. And to have um, somebody kind of call us on it <laughs> can be, it's like, oh no, you're just getting on my case again. You know, we can feel right. like that. It's, Absolutely. It, it's weird. It seems like too, they tend to focus on external parts when mm -hmm. they're a victim. Do you notice that too? And tell me more about that external parts. You know, like I'm looking, uh, you know, it's all, um, you know, we're focusing on this other person. Yeah. We're focusing on our job. We're focusing on, you know, my car always breaks down. You know, right. it's never yeah. looking back on ourselves. It mm -hmm. seems like it's hard for us to look back on ourselves and say, Absolutely. Hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's that's where the next step, the compassion step really comes in, because what so many of us, whether we have a victim wound, a broken wound, a shameful wound, uh, but thinking about the victim. So much of what we are craving is acceptance and kindness and love. And so if we can learn to offer ourselves the validation of, yeah, I have a right to be angry about this and acting on my anger in the same way that I've always acted on it is just going to get me more of the same. So we validate the feeling. We say it's okay to feel this way. Um, and it hurts to feel this way. So that's where that compassion piece comes in is saying, wow, yeah, it's, it's hard to feel this powerless and this, you know, craving for acceptance. Um, and that is often the thing, the compassion that opens the door for us to do something different because we dig our heels in waiting for someone else to be compassionate first. Yeah. Right. If people should, people should show us love rather than we yeah. showing ourselves love. Right. Yes. And that's something I talk about with my clients too, you know, mm. um, that if they're going through a really tough time, they have to feel those emotions because instead of putting themselves down for feeling it, you know, if right. we've grown up wanting that we feel we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. So frequently when we get angry, we think, oh, I shouldn't have gotten angry. That was bad. I shouldn't have done that. And then we beat ourselves up over it and we start that whole cycle of negative thinking again. Exactly. And yeah. how, do you, how do you get your people, your clients to 
show themselves compassion? How do they recognize it's okay to yeah. love every part of themselves, even the parts mm. that are crappy? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's kind of like the thing, right? So um, I really like using visualization because a lot of times if we can watch ourselves as children, you know, if we can go back to some of those original experiences that really set off whatever soul wound we may have, and we can see ourselves as children and we can watch from our adult place, what inevitably shows up is just a, like completely full heart of compassion because it's next to impossible to think that kid's just really stupid. Like, why don't they just get it together? <laughs> you know, you see a tiny person in pain and your first instinct is, I think, to nurture and support. So we kind of fake it till we make it by practicing on those inner children. And then it becomes just that much easier to offer our adult selves that same level of kindness and compassion, which isn't to say that like we offer ourselves kindness and compassion and then we just let ourselves off the hook for everything and we just feel like, you know, eat donuts all day and get manicures every, you know, three days because I'm being kind to myself after all. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very active, intentional way of living to come from a place of compassion, but we have to include ourselves in that formula and not just be giving it away to everyone else but ourselves. Exactly. Oh, it's so true. So true. I love. And for people who are just joining in, this is Dr. Candace Creesman, and she's a licensed professional counselor, and she has so many good ideas here to help us live a better life. You had mentioned earlier about addiction, and mm -hmm. um, we had talked briefly the other day when we spoke about addiction and alcohol, and. Where does this, do you have, have you found a pattern or anything for the soul wound story for people who suffer from that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, and again, this is, you know, kind of all anecdotal from my clinical experience, but um, I've definitely seen more of the addictive patterns in folks who have a broken soul wound. So they just have a real sense of being damaged, um, just inherently messed up in some kind of way. And I think that creates a wound that we innately want to medicate. You know, we any of the soul wounds are going to make us want to feel better and we're going to reach for whatever is going to give us the quickest response. But I think that broken wound, that sense of I'm just not enough, um, really lends itself to filling ourselves up with things that can actually really create addictive patterns. So, you know, what starts as self-medication certainly turns into a disease process where our brains actually start to change around, you know, the use of whatever substance we've chosen. Yeah, and uh, it's hard sometimes, you know, when we're uh, dealing with that in our families, you know, mm -hmm. we may have, and I know I've noticed a lot more um, a frequency, a greater frequency of clients in the past couple of years who are coming mm -hmm. to me who are either dealing with it themselves or a family member is. Yeah. And, you know, as we know, um, you can't force someone else to confront their issue. Right. So how can we use the information you have to live with someone who's suffering from addiction? Mm -hmm. What can we mm -hmm. do to handle their soul wound so that we don't perpetuate it for them or create something for ourselves? Right. Well, I think checking out um, if there is like a thread connecting um, your own soul wound to this person who also has addictive tendencies, because what I tend to find is one of the primary causes of any soul wound is coming from a family where addiction is a problem, you know, because that that inevitably leads to things like neglect, to things like having to keep secrets, um, sometimes to things like violence and you know, incarcerations that, you know, create real disruption and dysfunction in families. Um, so take ownership. You know, that is, that's really the message of any of this work is for as much as other people are screwed up, you know, that what they think and how they feel is never really going to be our business, you know, because we just really can't fix anyone other that fix this is a terrible word, but we really can't impact anyone other than ourselves. But then what happens from that is when we do find our wholeness, we do find our, our health, you know, is that that inevitably has a positive impact beyond ourselves. But if we come at it from the intention of I'm going to, you know, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon have this great um, acronym, you know, it's the three C's. I didn't cause it. I can't cure it. And I can't control it. You know, we really have to lean into that kind of uncertainty when we're dealing with folks who have addiction. And that's really, really hard when you love someone and they're hurting.
Yeah. And so for us, you know, people who might be living with that situation, we just kind of have to look at ourselves and do what we can for ourselves then. Absolutely. Really. And set good and boundaries. Be open. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, um, I always like to ask everybody, um, what's one thing you feel is the most important thing someone can do to create their most inspired, mm -hmm. best life? Mm. What is one thing that people can do? Yeah, gosh, I think the most important thing we can do is make friends with our minds, you know, is rather than feeling like we're just constantly at the mercy of whatever thought we're having, or whatever, whatever feeling we're having is to, you know, recognize that all of that is happening in this bigger space of who we really are. And we don't have to be fearful of any of it. 